So the, the title of the lecture today is called The Microeconomic Foundations of Aggregate Production Functions. So these are technical terms. Let me try to explain in, uh, in layman terms uh, what they mean. Uh, an aggregate production function is the way uh, typically in, in macroeconomics we summarize the productive capacity of an economy. How much an economy is able to produce from its factors of production, from labor, from capital, from land, and things like that. And uh, the way we typically proceed is by simply assuming this aggregate production function. And instead, what I'm trying to do in this lecture is to develop the micro foundations of these aggregate production functions, which means building it from the grounds up, understanding how uh, microeconomic production decisions that are interlinked uh, in a production network give rise to the production possibilities uh, of an economy. And the hope is that by disaggregating these aggregate production functions, by understanding where they come from, we can understand them better build better models and make better predictions. Right, so I think there is a, a lot of truth to this, uh, unfortunately. And if you look at uh, most or uh, macroeconomic models today, or a lot of macroeconomic models today, they still uh, postulate these aggregate relationships. So an aggregate production function that's meant to summarize how the economy produces from the factors, and a representative consumer that's meant to describe how uh, the goods are demanded uh, and uh, there's been a, a lot of developments over the past 20 years uh, on the consumption side. So to try to move from a representative agent to a heterogeneous agent economy. To take, uh, to take into account the reality that there are a lot of different heterogeneous consumers uh, that they behave very differently and that understanding this heterogeneity and how it aggregates is important to formulate macroeconomic predictions. But very little has been done on the production side. And most of macro today still operates with aggregate production functions. And what I'm trying to do with my co-author, David Bakai, is uh, a research agenda that's meant to uh, disaggregate production in general and, uh, and to really build macro from the ground up to bring macro and micro closer together. So the starting point of this uh, original initiative was a dissatisfaction with the status quo in the Eurozone. Like we view the current arrangement in the Eurozone to be uh, uh, essentially at the point of maximal fragility, where you have too much integration. Uh, we share a common currency, for example, and so countries have uh, given up the tool of an independent monetary policy, but not enough integration. So they don't have the other tools to compensate for the loss of the monetary instrument. So we're in this in-between, which is very dangerous. And the crisis that we've been through is an illustration of these deficiencies. And uh, the problem is that there's a lot of disagreement as to exactly how the Eurozone should be moving forwards, and these disagreement uh, fall on national lines and they're very political. So what we wanted to see is if it was possible to find uh, some uh, consensus, some compromise uh, between French and German positions and so uh, we grouped together six French economists and six German economists and we tried to see if we could find like some common ground, some reforms that we all agreed could improve the functioning of the Eurozone. And it was important to have uh, uh, this composition of nationalities, French and German, because there's typically uh, in Europe have been, there's been a dividing line between the French view and the German view. And so we thought that if we could find some uh, workable solution among ourselves, then this would be a step forward. And so the title of our report is Reconciling uh, Market Discipline and Resharing. And market discipline is typically associated with the German view and resharing with the, the French view. And uh, we feel that it's a bit of a false dichotomy and that it's possible to make progress by having at the same time better market discipline and more resharing. And so we've identified a couple of areas for very concrete reforms and very concrete proposals. Uh, so they fall in three categories. Uh, there are reforms of the financial architecture of the Eurozone, reforms of the fiscal architecture of the Eurozone, and reform of the institutional structure uh, of the Eurozone. So if you want, I can elaborate, uh, for example, on the, the, fiscal, the, the financial uh, architecture. The idea is, at the same time, to move forward with the banking union, to complete the banking union, and to uh, also uh, try to develop, uh, uh, to implement steps 
that will uh, foster greater uh, uh, capital market integration so that you can move to a capital market union. For the banking unions, very concretely, the things that are necessary are uh, the, create, the creation of a European deposit insurance scheme, uh, the fiscal backstopping of the resolution mechanism at the European level. So that's for the resharing part. And on the market discipline part, it's very important to break the doom loop uh, between banks and sovereigns, which originates in the fact that uh, if you look at, uh, for example, a country like Spain, most of the sovereign debt of Spain is held by uh, Spanish banks. And that's true in other countries as well, and that's actually a pattern that was reinforced with the crisis. And that creates these doom loop, these vicious circles, where uh, the banks depend on their sovereigns and the sovereigns depend on the banks. So if the banks get in trouble, then the sovereign has to come to the rescue and the sovereign gets in trouble. And because the banks hold the debt of the sovereign, then if the sovereign gets in trouble, the banks get in trouble, uh, etc. And that was widely perceived to be uh, really a, a catalytic mechanism for the crisis uh, in the Eurozone. And it's not uh, something that's been solved yet. And so what we're pro proposing to break the doom loop is to, uh, to beef up uh, banking regulation, basically, and to change it by introducing concentration charges to force uh, the banks in the Eurozone to hold diversified portfolios of the sovereign debt of all countries. So the idea is not to reduce the overall exposure to the sensitive countries, that debt has to be held by the banks in the Eurozone, but uh, to make sure that it's spread evenly, that there's better risk sharing. Uh, so that's for the market discipline part of the financial architecture. Then we have proposals also on the fiscal side. So on the fiscal side, we think that the, the current budget uh, system of budget rules is very opaque, is very ill-conceived, is non-transparent, there's no accountability, there are rigidities where there shouldn't be, there are flexibilities where there shouldn't be. And so we would like to do a bit of a tabula rasa and to, uh, to propose a, a much simpler uh, system that we think will be flexible in the right place and uh, provide the right incentives uh, in the others. And so the idea is to move uh, towards uh, uh, national expenditure rules uh, that would be set by national fiscal councils uh, and with the correction for the, the level of debt. That's one part of it. Uh, the second part is to facilitate debt restructuring uh, because that's something that's very difficult uh, in, uh, in the Eurozone despite the adoption of some collective action clauses. So we, we would like to make that uh, easier. And the third thing is to create uh, a, a joint fiscal capacity to help alleviate asymmetric shocks uh, in the Eurozone. Uh, so that would be the creation of a fund at the European level, and countries could tap into these funds when uh, they're hit with large uh, asymmetric shock. And finally, on the institutional side, uh, we think that it's very important in order to make uh, these budget rules uh, have some bite, to have a clear institutional setup where you separate the function of prosecutor and the function of judge, which are right now conflated in the same institution. Right, so the, there has to be some political will behind these reforms because some of them uh, involve some uh, transfer of sovereignty uh, to the European level uh, and the mutualization of resources at the European level. So there needs to be a political will and there needs to be trust uh, in the European project. And uh, we view these three pillars, uh, financial, fiscal and institutional, as complementary. And we think that you need to advance on the three fronts at the same time if you want to uh, propose a credible package that can assuage uh, the fears of the different, uh, the different countries uh, in the euro. And we think also that it's important to, to do it now because there's a, there's a rare opportunity, basically, uh, with uh, two countries that uh, didn't trust each other so much in the past and are starting to trust each other again, France and Germany. Uh, the legacy of the crisis is starting to recede a little bit. And so we think that right now there's, uh, there's a window of opportunity and we hope that something will come out of this. So I think the big, one big risk that I see is that we do not seize on this opportunity, that we do some cosmetic and symbolic reforms, and that another crisis hits in the next five, ten years, who knows, and that exacerbates and repeats the sort of uh, tensions, the political tensions and the economic tensions that we've seen at play uh, this time around. And if it happens the second time in a row, I think that would really jeopardize the trust in the European project. 
So I think it's important to, to do something now, and I think it's possible to do it. And I hope that people will rise up to the challenge. So I don't have a crystal ball. So like everybody, I'm seeing this uh, moment uh, of like very messy uh, transition where we see like very different reactions to not only the crisis, but like big structural forces uh, in the world, like globalization and technical change that are compounded by uh, the effects of the crisis uh, in the Eurozone. Um, and that's creating the two sort of very different reactions. There's the rise of right-wing and left-wing populism in some countries in the Eurozone, and uh, you have other countries which are moving in another direction. Uh, I don't know exactly how this will play out. It's clearly a very combustible uh, situation. And I just hope that the political uh, risks that are materializing will serve as an impetus uh, for reform. Because uh, I think it's not the last time, if we don't do anything, it's not the last time that we'll see these dynamics at play.